So the last three weeks, we've undertaken a study of the life and the actions of Jesus in order to think about what Jesus meant when he said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. From Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. And so we, we, we started out this series by sort of setting the stage with that passage of Scripture and, 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 and asking the question, okay, Jesus, if, if you said that your yoke was easy and that your burden was light, then how do we live in that way? What does that actually look like? Because the modern experience for the most of us is not one of lightness, of unburdening. What does that actually mean? What does that actually look like? We talked about the fact that Jesus is the wise ox who is in the other side of that yoke. And we're the untrained ox. And we match our pace with him. We learn practically how to walk as he walked. And through that learning process, we learn to carry the load that he has given us. And to carry it in a lighter way. So in week one, we talked about priorities and how to seek first the kingdom of God. In week two, we talked about Sabbath and God's gift of rest. And that if we live in that rhythm of resting one day out of the week, just taking one day out of seven to say, God, I'm just going to attune my heart to you and be focused on you, how much that reduces the burdens in life and the way that we carry them. Week three, we talked about relationships and how we can't, we're not omnipresent. We can't give all of our attention, attention to everyone all the time. We have to conserve our energy relationally for the relationships that are most vital and most important, and we have to prioritize them. In week four, we talked about abiding and a life of closeness. And last week, Mitch walked us through uh, slowing down, not running at a high pace, but actually matching our steps with the steps of Jesus and saying, you know what, I'm not going to allow the urgency of the world to press against me in such a way that I just run around like a chicken with my head cut off in a, cut off in a, in a hurried, hurried manner. And today we're going to talk about simplicity. The discipline of simplicity. Paul the Apostle warned the young pastor Timothy about the types of teachers that would lure people into teaching. Saying that following Jesus was a, was a way to have a materially rich life. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10 Paul tells Timothy, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Let me say that again. Godliness with contentment is great gain. He goes on to say, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, and into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Paul warns Timothy, he says, hey, there's going to be these false teachers who come in and they're, they're, going, to, they're going to talk about the gospel and they're going to talk about uh, following Jesus and being a disciple of Jesus as though that was a way to, to have your best life now. But 
I, I, I want you to know, Timothy, that's not the reality. Actually following Jesus means that we learn to live contentedly. That, that we pursue godliness and that godliness along with that contentment is in fact great gain for us. So when Paul says godliness with contentment is great gain, what does he mean? Is this, is this consistent with what Jesus taught? Is, is Paul continuing the teaching of Jesus? Or is, or is he saying something different? You see, there's a, there's a type of striving that man is prone towards. St. Augustine said it this way. He said, thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord. And our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Augustine wrote that in his famous memoir, Confessions, that tells the story of his conversion. And Augustine tells us, listen, I, I see this condition in me, but not only in me, I see it in the rest of humanity, that there is this restlessness that is in the heart of every, mind, of every man and every woman. We, we don't find true rest until our hearts are found in the Lord. That restlessness is what keeps us from being able to be still. It keeps us from abiding. It keeps us bouncing from shallow relationship to shallow relationship. It keeps us from ceasing the endless labor and finding the true joy in rest and Sabbath. It is what keeps us scattered and keeps us from being focused on God because craving causes us to chase many things in life. I love what Corey Ten Boom said. She said it this way. If the devil cannot make us bad, he will make us busy. He'll distract us. He'll get us carried off in all kinds of little areas to where our attention and our focus is on things that do not matter, and we sacrifice the things that do matter to focus on the things that don't. We sacrifice the things that are eternal to focus on the things that are temporal. So in response to this restlessness, this busyness, humanity is on a quest trying to answer some basic questions. And these questions are the cornerstone of basically all advertising, all lust-provoking that happens in the world. The questions kind of go like this. Well, what will it take for you to have a satisfied life? What's it going to take? What would it take for you to feel like your life was not squandered or that your life was not wasted? What experience? Is it that vacation to Bali? Is it that, that one exotic trip? Is it the roller coaster ride? Is it, is it the trip to Disneyland? What experience? What thing? Is it an air fryer? Is that the one thing that's going to finally make your kitchen complete? You'll never have to buy another appliance again? Is it the next toy? The next outfit? What is it? What lifestyle or wealth? Now, I'm old enough to remember a series that was super popular back in the 80s called Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Anybody remember that? If you do, you're over 35. <laughs> where, where we sat in our living rooms and dreamed about what it would be like to have this lifestyle that was so luxurious. What lifestyle or what wealth, what need would have to be met in your life in order for you to feel like you need nothing else? to feel satiated, satisfied. 
You know, in answer to, in answer to these questions, we're going to read some excerpts from a few teachings that Jesus gave on the subject of accumulation and on his perspective on a lifestyle of simplicity. So let's start here in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19. He says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you're a note taker, I would like you to write this down. Where your treasure is, your heart will be. Where your treasure is, your heart will be. See, the thing is, is you, you can't help it. The things that you collect are the things that you value in life. And if the treasure that you invest in is earthly, is temporary, you will be consumed with how to protect it. Your thoughts and your energy will be consumed with like, how do I keep it from getting stolen or broken? How do I treasure my treasure? How do I keep it from rusting? How do I keep moths from eating it? How do I protect it from being stolen by thieves? If, however, your treasure is eternal and can't be taken away, your anxieties are minimized and your treasure cannot be taken. It's a pretty simple principle. Your heart follows what you see the most value in. It is a spiritual principle that we cannot escape. That's just the reality of how we work. Now, previously, we discussed a, a couple of parables that Jesus gave in, uh, in a previous teaching. He gave these parables in regards to treasuring the kingdom. So flip over from Matthew 6 to Matthew 13, just real quick. In Matthew 13, beginning at verse 40, uh, 44, Jesus said this, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man which a man found and covered up. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Second parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding the one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. The message is clear here from these two parables. Some treasures are worth giving everything else up for. Some treasures are so valuable that the loss of everything cannot be compared to the loss that we would feel having passed up that treasure. Jesus tells us through these parables that the treasure is the kingdom of heaven. And when you know the value of the kingdom of heaven, giving up everything else for that treasure is considered a small sacrifice. Why? Because you can't imagine anything else more valuable. You go, okay, I, if the kingdom is the pearl of great price and I am the pearl merchant, I'll give up all of my pearls for this one pearl. If, if, if I'm the farmer who's plowing in a field and I, I, I pull up some treasure, selling off every single earthly possession that I own for the sake of purchasing the field with the treasure is more valuable than what I'm giving up. In the process. So, the idea here is that when we see rightly the treasure of the kingdom, the things around us pale in comparison 
When we rightly see how amazing and how valuable the kingdom of heaven really is, there's nothing we wouldn't give up to be a part of it. Having said that, there are many who have believed that reality only to begin to slowly start treasuring once again the things they gave up for the kingdom in the first place. So, for those of you who are note takers, point two, treasuring the wrong treasure can choke out fruitfulness. Treasuring the wrong treasure can choke out fruitfulness. Here in in Matthew 13, there's another parable that Jesus gives. Right at the very beginning of the chapter, he gives the parable of the sower and the seed, or the parable of the soils, as some call it, in which he lists four types of soil. Verse 1 of chapter 13, the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered to him, so that he got down into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach and he told them many things in parables saying, a sower went out to sow and he sowed some, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. And other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. So Jesus gives this parable. Now, it seems kind of mysterious at the forefront, and if you've been around church culture, I'm sure that you've heard this parable. But Jesus here also gives the disciples the interpretation down below. In verse 18, he says this, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, and yet he has no root in himself. But he endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for the one who was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another case sixty, and in another thirty. So, Jesus gives us the interpretation. The sower is Jesus. The seed is the gospel of the kingdom. And the soils are the hearts of those that receive the message, the seed of the gospel of the kingdom. So, soil one hears... And does not understand and and the enemy comes in like birds of the air and snatches away the seed and, and he never even gets a chance to grow. It's stolen away from him. Soil two hears and receives with gladness but this is a soil that is, is filled with rocky ground. And it only has a shallow interaction with the seed. The, the roots of the seed cannot go down deep. And, as a result, whenever hard times come, the seed is scorched, never bears fruit, and withers away. Soil three is that sown among the thorns. And this is the person who hears, receives, and begins growing, but there are competing seeds in the soil of their heart. These competing seeds grow up along with the seeds of the kingdom and eventually they begin to choke out the fruitfulness of the kingdom in that heart. It becomes unfruitful. According to Jesus, 
It is possible to receive the message of the kingdom, agree with its value, and have it choked out by competition in the heart. The seed or the message is alive in the heart. It's alive in the heart of the hearer. It just doesn't produce anything. The other seeds, the other treasures, the other competition in the heart of that individual steal the resources that are needed in order for the seed to grow to a place of fruit bearing. And Jesus is saying here, look, the seed of the kingdom, there's nothing wrong with that. That that message, when preached, is received by different types of hearts. But listen, if there are competing values in the heart of a person, you will love one and hate the other. Treasuring the wrong treasure can can choke out the fruitfulness of the seed of the gospel of the kingdom. In other words, what we treasure should make a difference in how we live. It should be reflected in our values. It doesn't mean that we can't be good stewards or even be graciously blessed by a benevolent God. It means that the way our hearts interact with God's blessing matters. Let me say that again. The way in which our hearts interact with God's blessing matters. It is the difference between bearing fruit and being choked out. It means that the way that our hearts interact with God's blessing matters. When those blessings are in competition with the kingdom, we are in danger. We say, okay, it can become unfruitful, but the seed's still alive. (laughs) I mean, doesn't that count for something? Isn't that okay? How, how big is this danger? Well, fortunately, we're not left in the dark here. Jesus tells us. Flip over to Matthew 16 with me. Matthew 16 is one of those stories that we, we love because it's a triumphant moment for one of Jesus' disciples, Peter. Jesus asks the disciples the question of, who do people say that I am? And, you know, they say, well, some say Jeremiah or John the Baptist or one of the prophets or whatever. Peter pipes up. And Peter says, oh, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, Jesus turns to Peter and says, you are so blessed, Simon. Do you realize That flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven, revealed this to you. And on that confession, Peter, you're you're Peter, you're the rock, on the confession that you just made, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm going to give to you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you open or loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Peter, I am so excited for what you have just revealed. As amazing as this moment is, it's all about to turn a little sour, maybe even a little bit harsh. Notice what follows, verse 21. Chapter 16, right after Peter's confession, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Notice Jesus' response. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. 
Then Jesus turns this into a teaching moment for all of the disciples who have just heard Jesus rebuke Peter. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Jesus rebukes Peter. Jesus tells him that he's not valuing the things of God. Rather, he is valuing the things of man. Now, what, do, what does he mean by that? Well, remember, Jesus just told Peter that he was going to have the keys to the kingdom. What, what, what's Peter thinking about keys to the kingdom? What's that mean in his mind? Well, he's thinking of a, a physical messianic reign here on earth where he gets to act as a sort of ambassador or vice regent or some person with authority and power. All he knows is he gets the keys. He thinks, oh man, this is awesome. I just did the right thing. And look at the reward. When Jesus becomes king of Israel and throws off the Roman oppressors, he's going to give all the keys to the kingdom to me. So when Jesus then turns around and starts saying, okay, so now we're going to go to Jerusalem and we're, uh, we're, we're going to be persecuted. I'm going to be uh, arrested. I'll be put on trial unjustly. I'll be killed, crucified. And then three days later, I'll rise again from the dead. Peter's like, whoa, 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 hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. Remember the key thing? We, we, we just talked about this. Remember, riches, treasure, I'm the guy, get the keys. <laughs> Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Right now, your agenda, Peter, is so far opposed to God's agenda that you don't even see, you're actually in league with the accuser right now. You don't even realize it. You are valuing the things of man, physical keys and kingdoms, and not the things of God. When Jesus starts talking about going to Jerusalem and being betrayed, suffering at the hands of the religious leaders and being killed on a cross, it interferes with Peter's concept of treasure. It interferes with the kingdom that he's been dreaming up ever since he found out that he gets the keys. Peter did not understand that the keys that Jesus was talking about were the keys to the kingdom of God, that, that Peter would be the one who in Acts 2 would stand up and preach the gospel on the day of Pentecost and the gates of the kingdom would be opened up to the house of Israel. Peter didn't understand that in Acts chapter 10, he would be preaching to Cornelius, a Gentile, and he would be the one who brings the gospel, opens up the gates of the kingdom to the Gentiles and the rest of the known world at that time. He had no idea that that was what God had prepared. He was set on a physical kingdom with physical riches and physical power. Peter did not understand the glory of the kingdom that God had prepared. Peter's keys jingled and opened earthly and physical gates, but the keys that Jesus spoke of were spiritual and opened the gates of heaven to sinners and salvation to the world. Jesus is saying to Peter and to the other disciples, listen, following me will mean self-denial. It will mean putting all of your eggs in one basket. Basket. It will mean treasuring the greatest treasure first and foremost, above all other things. It will mean forsaking 
the things that are secondary, to live for the things that are essential. And living for essential things will undoubtedly lead them into conflict with things that the world values, like your life. I mean, think about the invitation. It, uh, uh, maybe a, a good way to, to, to compare this would be to compare this with what we know as an execution device, the electric chair. Imagine if I said, hey, listen, Heritage, we want you to be disciples. And as a result of wanting you to be a disciple, here's what we would invite you to do. Everybody, grab your electric chair. Go ahead and strap yourself to it, and uh, let's follow Jesus together. You know, wait, wait, huh, hold on. <laughs> uh, that doesn't make sense. That sounds like torture and death. And Jesus is saying, yeah, that, that's right. Take up my cross. Take up your cross and follow in my footsteps. I'm going to Golgotha. I'm going, disciples, to the hill of Calvary where I will bear my cross and I will be crucified and die. And I'm inviting you to come with me. You want to be my disciple? You're going to have to deny the things that the world values and love the things that God values. Would you notice the precise wording of Jesus here in this passage? He says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? The Greek word for soul here is suche. And sometimes it's interpreted breath, which is a, a nod back to Genesis and the breath of God that was breathed into Adam so that he became a living soul. Perhaps you'll remember that passage. Other times it's translated life because it is the summarized essence of your existence. All that you have or ever will experience personally is what is experienced not just through the five senses but how that is processed in the immaterial part of you the soul Dallas Willard makes a, a fabulous point here that I think is is very important he points out in this passage that losing your soul is something that you can do long before your soul arrives at its destination the soul is the part of you that's immaterial. It's the thing behind the brain that's sort of pulling all the levers and telling the brain what to do. If you think about it this way, neurons don't think. They're just vehicles. They're just pathways for thinking. Something behind the brain is telling the neurons how to fire. That's the immaterial, eternal part of you, the soul gives life and animates the body. As a philosophical point, it is the truest essence of who you really are. It's the specially designed part of you that is, that, that is unique in all of creation. It is the thumbprint that makes you distinct and different from every other soul on the planet. It is the compilation of the mind Again, not talking brain, the, the, the thinking part that directs the brain, the will, the emotions, and the experiences that have shaped you, and it is unique to who you are. And here Jesus says, it is possible to lose your soul in a quest to gain the world. There's a way to live that so entangles us with what is temporary that we lose our soul. We lose who we are created to be by God in the first place. We lose that in the process, chasing material things, thinking that that's going to somehow satisfy or make us happy. But 
our soul is lost chasing other things. We're wandering around from place to place to place seeking something that will satisfy. And this is the crux of the issue for so many of us. How to have an undivided soul. Or as Jesus says back in Matthew 6, an undivided eye, a single affection, a single devotion. Our beginning passage in Matthew 6 concludes with this in Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You see, for the disciple of Jesus, there's an attitude of the heart that values essential things first and foremost. And it places secondary things in their proper order. This is what is at the heart of the spiritual discipline of simplicity. It means narrowing the focus in our lives the focus of our attention, the focus of our affection to the very most important things, the most important realities. St. Augustine is, I think, helpful here as well. You see, Augustine argued that virtue is essentially rightly ordered love. Virtue is rightly ordered love and that sin, conversely, is disordered love. In other words, when our affections are set in the right places, on the right things, what happens is, what happens is right actions follow. And when our hearts are set on wrong things, or our affections, our attention is set on wrong things, then wrong actions follow. And, and, and what has to happen in the heart of a person is that their affections, their loves, the things that they crave need to be ordered rightly in order for them to have a rightly ordered life. To have rightly ordered loves brings clarity to the ways in which we invest our time, our effort, our attitudes, our actions. And Jesus is arguing through these passages that a life free of the need to possess, to amass material wealth and goods is a life that is free. And it's not entangled in the affairs of this world, but rather it's all wrapped up and entangled in the kingdom. When our affections are right, we are entangled in God's kingdom and not entangled in the things that are temporary. And it is a rightly ordered affection that leads to right actions. To put it simply, being a disciple, or as Dallas Willard likes to say, an apprentice of Jesus requires simple living or the discipline of simplicity. We cannot live for what is temporary. We have to live for what's eternal. Jesus called those around him to live like he lived and to do what he did. Do you remember what Jesus said? He said, you know, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Do you remember when it came time to pay taxes for Jesus? He didn't have any money, so what did he do? He sent the disciples fishing to go fish for money and there was a fish with a gold coin in its mouth that enabled him to pay his taxes. He lived with less. So, okay, wait, now, Jeremy, are you asking us to become homeless like Jesus? No, that's not it at all. I'm, I'm, I'm asking us to examine whether we are unattached like Jesus, whether or not our lives are simple, whether or not we're focused on the right things. Because we cannot be a disciple of Jesus and love the world with our hearts. In Luke chapter 12, verses 14 to 21, Jesus again speaking, but he said to him, man, 
Uh, let me actually pick up just a little bit further down. He said to the crowd, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of, the th- of his possessions. Let me, let me say that again. Take care, be on guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And then he tells them this parable, saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For uh, I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I'll, I'll tear down my barns and I'll build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see, contrary to popular opinion, it is not stuff that brings contentment. It is not things or experiences or entertainment that brings fulfillment. It is where we place our focus, where we place our affection. You know, for thousands of years, Christians have been practicing the discipline of simplicity, choosing to free themselves of worldly entanglements, things that drain mental, physical, financial, emotional, and spiritual energy from their lives. Now, we're not talking about asceticism. We're not talking about becoming monks and just you know, living in a small little room with only a table and a bed. That's not what we're talking about. Instead, we're talking about clearing the desk at work, uncluttering our emotional lives, and our possessions at home, our tasks and energy, the clutter on our lives, clearing it in a way that enables us to more fully focus on the kingdom. It's a matter of ordering our lives so that the primary things get the most of our energy and secondary things take the least of our energy in life. You know, this is actually a secret that the world has discovered. There is this thing called minimalism. You guys have heard of minimalism, right? It's a big movement. It's been made popular by the likes of Marie Kondo and her Netflix series. And it's become super trendy in places like Portland that's filled with hipsters who like sip like single origin coffee that was organically shade grown by pet gorillas in the jungles of, you know, wherever, right? They get up in the morning, they do this morning ritual with their coffee, and it can't be a traditional coffee pot. It has to be a siphon filter pour-over thing that arrow pressed into a handmade ceramic coffee cup. Like, we know. In in places like that, minimalism thrives because it's a cluttered environment. It's a world in a city where there's lots and lots of things that's just always happening and you are continually stimulated. So when you remove some of the stimulation, it actually brings a sense of peace. And and it's become very popular, but I want to make a distinction here. We're not talking about minimalism for minimalism's sake. Even though the likes of Einstein, remember the stories of Einstein that he had the same exact suit in his closet over and over and over again so he never had to make a decision about what to wear. He could conserve all of his mental energy to mathematics and problem solving, thinking about science stuff. Or we think of Steve Jobs, right? With this classic black turtleneck. He's wearing the same thing all the time. Because he devoted all of his thinking power, concentrated all of his thinking power towards problem solving for Apple. Yeah, I mean, heck, even in and out has sort of figured this out, right? That when there's so many options on the menu, people stand there and go, uh. 
So they make a really simple menu. You know what they actually find? A simple menu causes the joy of the experience to go up. People are more satisfied when the decision is easy to make. The less options people have, the easier it is for them to make decisions. And the happier they are in the experience and the outcome. But, but what I'm describing here is not simply minimalism or just reduction. You see, when life gets too cluttered, we actually raise anxiety. When you have 136 options for things to wear every day, your morning routine gets very complicated. You stand and you stare at the dresser and you stare at the closet and you try and make decisions for 20 minutes. Your brain is overwhelmed by how much that there is. When your desk has 87 options of things that need to be done in a day, what happens is you interact with each of those things shallowly rather than doing deep work and being able to make progress. It keeps your brain from focusing on the most important things. And when your life is riddled with things that require maintenance, upkeep, and attention, you're kept busy maintaining what is temporary and unfocused on what is eternal. And simplicity is a spiritual discipline that keeps us from living in restless craving keeps us from pursuing all these different things and keeps us focused on the things that are the most valuable. Where minimalism helps to declutter, simplicity is an all-encompassing philosophy that affects our possessions, our living spaces, our workspaces, our relationships, our emotional baggage, our spiritual lives, our financial resources. Minimalism focuses primarily on external but simplicity focuses on the internal drivers in our hearts, in our lives. And it is primarily not just concerned with the material, but it's concerned with the spiritual as a focus. So when we invite you to the practice of simplicity, what we're saying, and when we take the teachings of Jesus literally, and we say that this is actually instruction for our lives to not be entangled with the things of this world, to not be focused on what is temporary, to not give our hearts and our affection to those things. What we're actually inviting you to is to the practice of decluttering your life to focus on the kingdom. Or as Hebrews says it, laying aside the weight and sin that slows us down from running the race that's set before us. Now, if this is something that you'd like to explore, we have put together a resource, and for the next month, I'm going to be implementing this practice in my own life. Now, we, we just moved from an apartment to a house, and we thought we simplified to get into the apartment, and what we found is we had, we had to have a, a garage that we rented to store all of our stuff, even after giving away tons of stuff and, you know, uh, yard sailing and goodwilling and going to the dump multiple times. So then we moved from the apartment to the house. And what we found was when we moved from the apartment to the house, we got rid of more stuff. And yet, I still, not, I still cannot walk through my garage. That, that's the reality of it. I have more than I need. That's the truth. This morning, I went to pick out clothes. And you know what I did? I did the safe thing. I picked out clothes that I always pick out. And there are some clothes that I haven't touched in two years that are sitting on my closet and in my dresser. I'm not going to wear them. That's the truth. I need to get rid of them. And so I'll be taking a, a load to the dump, something to goodwill, whatever they'll take. <laughs> I'll be exploring this. And for the next month, we're going to have a one-week focus for four weeks on ways to minimize and declutter in life in order that our home is a place of rest where the focus isn't on maintenance in a lot of areas, but on the things that are essential. But before I close today, I wanna, I wanna say this. There are two ways specifically that this affects our, this understanding of simplicity affects our life together here as a church. It, first of all, it affects how we serve. 
You know, there's a lot of options for things to do for the kingdom within the church. As a matter of fact, every person has their, like, this, their own creative thing of like, oh, this is what I feel God has really called me to, and so will you make it a church thing, and, and then we can all do this all together. Which is great, but it's not what the whole church is called to do. It's what you have been called to do. And sometimes what happens in the, in the course of time is that a church amasses like all these different little sort of, sort of pet projects, Right? And, and then as we talk about that to the church, we, you go, okay, well, I need to be involved in, you know, the Monday night thing and then the Tuesday afternoon thing and then there's the Wednesday night thing and then also on Thursday there's this thing and then if I really want to be a missional Christian, I need to serve on Saturdays and mow my neighbor's yard and then I also need to be here on Sunday. We have intentionally reduced the number of things that we provide here at Heritage. A couple of years ago, maybe, maybe you'll remember how we got rid of some of the programming here at Heritage. We, we dropped um, the Wednesday night services and we dropped Awana because here's what we realized. What we realized is we we're saying, okay, Heritage Saints, here is what we think would be best for you. We think that it would be awesome if you came to the big Sunday gathering where we could all sort of like mirror what is going to happen in heaven and in the kingdom for eternity. And definitely be there for that. And then afterwards, you could do the flip side of 50 thing or maybe if you're involved in a huddle group, you should go to your huddle group. And then Sunday night, you can do your huddle group thing. And then Monday mornings, we have a men's gathering. It's a little Bible study at this coffee shop. You can come and be a part of that. And then Tuesday, the ladies are getting together at the hub. And then Wednesday night, there's youth group for your kids. And then there's also a big people church. And there's Awana that's happening that night as well. Now, we're really short on volunteers for Awana. So what we would really like is for you to come to the service, not attend the service, serve in the Awana team. Be a part of what is happening there and then serve our kids so that our kids know what, how, what a joy it is to follow Jesus. And then Thursday night, we're, we're going to have this other get-together. It's just a worship night, small gathering. And then on Friday, do this thing. Oh, and by the way, be missional too. Go out and get to know your neighbors, coach your, your kids' softball team, be involved in community outreach. And, and then on Sunday, we'll see you again next week. And at some point you go, okay, how will people do all of this and still develop deep and rich spiritual lives for themselves? They can't. At some level, every Christian will have to say no to good things in order to say yes to great things. Know your calling. Know what God has called you to. And invest yourself there. Become a sharpshooter, not a machine gunner. The second thing that it affects is how we teach. We're a gospel-centered church, and this is one of our core values. In order to keep it simple, we want to make sure that all that we think about, all that we do, flows out of our understanding of the gospel itself. This is a core value, and it's attached to everything that we do at Heritage. But I, I want to say that one of the hazards of having this as a core value is that if everything is attached to the gospel, then the message of the gospel can sometimes become muddied. You see, the gospel is the plan of God for the redemption of the world. It's his plan to save and redeem the world. It is the message that a good God created the world and everything in it for his glory. Sin spoiled it. God sent his son to rescue it and is coming to finish what he started at the return of Christ. The gospel is good news about who God is and what God is doing. Okay? There are issues that are outside of that that keep getting attached to the gospel itself. Listen, social justice and racial reconciliation are good things, but they are not the message of the gospel. They're not. Discipleship is super important, but it isn't the gospel. Spiritual disciplines are life-giving, but they aren't the gospel. 
Bible study is vital. But Bible study in itself isn't, in fact, the message of the gospel. Missional living is necessary. We want to be witnesses to the world. But it isn't the gospel itself. The gospel is that God created the world. Sin ruined it. God sent his son to rescue it through his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. And the son who ascended to the right hand of the father is coming back to finish the job and to set the world right under his rule as King Jesus. That's the gospel. And he has started the work of redemption in you and in me. We're the first fruits of what is coming. We're the down payment of what he's promised to the rest of the world. And so, what we teach here needs to reflect the simplicity of what the gospel is. We have to keep it simple. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we desire to keep it simple in our lives. And as we explore this discipline, I, I pray, God, that you would that you would draw us into a deeper sense of clearing the clutter in our lives, of being more focused on the kingdom, of being set free, Lord, from giving our affection and our attention to the things that are only temporary. God, would you draw us through your word into a lifestyle of simplicity that like Jesus we would have a single focus a single eye that our hearts would be undivided in their devotion and that our time and our energy is not wasted on things that are merely fading away we ask this in the name for the glory of Jesus Amen